11 o'clock, we should start the first panel. So happy to see you here in the plenary room of the European Parliament. Um, happy to welcome you here. Bienvenue à Bruxelles. Bienvenue dans cette salle plénière du Parlement européen, dans, à Bruxelles, en Belgique, le plus beau pays du monde. Thank you. No, uh, peut-être. Um, I will do something that is perhaps not usual, but I will speak in German afterwards. So you can use your headphones because I'm, because I'm coming from the German-speaking part of this beautiful country. There we speak German, and I will speak German right now. So my name is Pascal Arimont. Ich bin seit 2014 Mitglied dieses Europäischen Parlaments, dieses Hohen Hauses hier. Und es freut mich tatsächlich, Sie hier so in großer Menge auch in diesem Plenarsaal bei diesem Panel begrüßen ähm, zu dürfen. Ich begrüße auch all diejenigen, die online zugeschaltet sind und möchte mich und möchte alle, die hier daran teilnehmen, ganz herzlich willkommen heißen. Ich habe das Vergnügen, heute Vormittag das erste Fokuspanel der Beyond Growth 2023 Konferenz moderieren zu dürfen. Und das Thema dieses Panels ist Growth, ist Wachstum. Es ist wie bei uns Menschen, wer wächst, braucht Nahrung, Wasser, Rohstoffe. Eine Frage, die viele Wissenschaftler seit Jahrzehnten beschäftigt ist, und wir haben es eben gehört, wie kann Wachstum möglich sein, wenn Dinge, die wir zum Wachsen brauchen, endlich sind und immer mehr Menschen einen Teil davon haben möchten. Und was für uns Menschen gilt, gilt in gleichem Maße auch für unsere Erde. Dürfen oder können wir weiter wachsen, ohne dabei unsere Wachstumsgrundlagen zu zerstören oder ad nihilum zu führen? Müssen wir vielleicht anders wachsen, indem wir entweder die Rohstoffe auf nachhaltige Weise nutzen oder müssen wir sogar schrumpfen, um das Schlimmste zu vermeiden? Wir werden heute über diese Konzepte Green Growth, Post Growth und auch Degrowth sprechen. Unser heutiges europäisches Wachstumsmodell basiert vor allem auf Growth und dessen Messgrundlage oder die Messgrundlage dieses Wachstumsmodells ist das BIP oder auf Englisch das GDP. Ursula von der Leyen hat ihn eben schon zitiert, den guten Robert F. Kennedy, der tatsächlich gesagt hat, das Bruttosozialprodukt misst alles mit Ausnahme der Dinge, die das Leben lebenswert machen. Und doch richten wir uns nach wie vor maßgeblich nach dieser Zahl des BIP, um den aktuellen Zustand unserer Volkswirtschaft und damit auch eines Staates zu bemessen. Diese Zahl bestimmt auch sehr oft unsere politischen Ziele. Diese Zahl bestimmt in diesem Raum sehr oft unser politisches Handeln. Der Ökonom Paul Samuelson schrieb dazu, ohne volkswirtschaftliche Kennzahlen wie das BIP würden die politischen Entscheidungsträger in einem Ozean zusammenhangloser Daten treiben. Das BIP und die damit verbundenen Daten sind wie Leuchtsignale, die ihnen dabei helfen, die Wirtschaft in die angestrebte Richtung zu lenken. Doch kann das alleinige BIP in seiner heutigen Form die Richtschnur unseres politischen Handelns bleiben? Die Diskussion über die Kriterien, die das BIP bestimmen, ist nicht neu. Welche Messparameter hinzugefügt werden, um den wahren Wohlstand einer Gesellschaft zu messen oder deren Zukunftsperspektive zu bestimmen, ist extrem spannend, inspirierend und gleichfalls extrem schwierig. Dass sich ständig erhöhender Wohlstand im rein materiellen Sinne Menschen nicht notwendigerweise glücklicher macht, ist mittlerweile erwiesen und kann jeder auch bei sich und seinen Mitmenschen feststellen. Das Easterling-Paradox weist zumindest darauf hin, dass wohlhabende Menschen nicht noch mehr haben müssen, um noch glücklicher zu sein. Oder ist es gerade das pure wirtschaftliche Wachstum in seiner heutigen eher westlich geprägten Form, das die Ideen, die individuellen und kollektiven Rechte der Menschen und den technologischen Fortschritt mit sich bringt, um die Probleme zu lösen, die dieses Wachstum selbst geschaffen hat? 
Ich selbst bin kein Zukunftsforscher und kein Wirtschaftswissenschaftler mit Schwerpunkt Wachstumsprognosen wie die Experten, die wir gleich hier hören werden. Ich bin Altphilologe und Jurist, bin auf einem kleinen, familiengeprägten Bauernhof mit glücklichen Kühen und blühenden Wiesen groß geworden und habe jetzt das ausgesprochene Privileg, hier in diesem Europäischen Parlament, hier in diesem Saal, an dieser Zukunft, an der Klimaneutralität unseres Kontinentes bis zum Jahre 2050 mitzuschreiben. The famous Green Deal. Dieser Green Deal ist zumindest ein sehr konkreter Versuch, unseren Kontinent in eine andere, nachhaltigere Richtung zu bewegen. Ist das klug? Ist das richtig? Machen wir dabei einen ersten Schritt in die richtige Richtung? Ist das ein Schritt in Richtung nachhaltiges Wachstum? Heute lebe ich in einem kleinen Dorf mit 1200 Menschen und habe zwei kleine Kinder, die sind neun und zwölf. Wenn ich in Ihre Augen schaue, muss ich mir aber vor allen Dingen Ihnen die Frage beantworten, wie Ihre Welt in 10, 20 oder 50 Jahren aussehen wird. Und die Antwort darauf hat ganz viel mit dieser Frage nach dem Wachstum unserer Gesellschaften zu tun. Meine Aufgabe heute hier ist daher nicht, einen sehr klugen Beitrag zur Beantwortung dieser Frage zu leisten, sondern den Streit der besten Ideen dazu zu moderieren und selbst daraus Schlussfolgerungen am Ende ziehen zu können. Gemeinsam mit unseren Panel-Teilnehmern möchten wir einigen dieser grundsätzlichen Fragen nachgehen. Und um es nicht allzu trocken zu machen, haben wir unsere Panelisten gebeten, anhand von Narrativen, von Geschichten, von Bildern zu erläutern, welchen Wachstumsweg oder welcher Wachstumsweg in ihren Augen eingeschlagen werden sollte. Ganz konkret werden unsere Experten versuchen, die Fragen zu beantworten, wie unser Alltag in Zukunft aussehen würde, wenn das von ihnen bevorzugte Wachstumsmodell konkret angewendet würde. In dem Zusammenhang werden sie auch beleuchten, zu welchen sozialen, wirtschaftlichen Reibungen diese Modelle führen können. Bevor ich, unseren Experte, bevor ich die Experten vorstelle, lassen Sie mich kurz unserem Partner Research and Degrowth danken, mit dem wir dieses Panel inhaltlich vorbereiten durften. Auch das Koordinatorenteam meines lieben Kollegen Philipp Lamberts stand uns mit Rat und Tat zur Seite. Vielen Dank dafür, Chef Philipp. Wir Abgeordnete, die dieses Event gemeinsam auf die Beine gestellt haben, gehören tatsächlich unterschiedlichen Fraktionen, politischen Formationen an, mit unterschiedlichen Weltanschauungen. Diese Veranstaltung ist aber, glaube ich, ein schöner Beleg dafür, dass man jenseits aller politischen Differenzen gut zusammenarbeiten kann und die Welt von morgen gemeinsam neu zu denken. Werte Zuhörerinnen und Zuhörer, kommen wir nun zu unseren Panelisten, die ich Ihnen in der Präsentationsreihenfolge vorstellen möchte. Beginnen wir oder beginnen möchte ich mit Elina Eriksen, Professorin am Royal Institute of Technology in Schweden. Elina hat sich nicht nur dankenswerterweise bereit erklärt, direkt im Anschluss ein paar einleitende Impulse zu geben, sondern auch die Diskussionsrunde nachher mit mir zu moderieren. Es freut mich auch, Professor Michael Jacobs von der University of Sheffield hier begrüßen zu können, der Aspekte zum grünen Wachstum erläutern wird. Anschließend ist es mir eine große Freude, zwar nicht direkt im Saal, aber online ähm, Maya Göpel zu begrüßen. Sie ist Transformationsforscherin, gelernte Politikökonomin, Expertin für Nachhaltigkeit. Nachhaltigkeitspolitik und sie schreibt Bücher, die sogar ich verstehe. Und schließlich, um die Runde zu vervollständigen, darf ich Ihnen Ekaterina Tscherkoskaya vorstellen. Sie ist Forscherin an der Lund-Universität Universität in Schweden. Bevor ich Elina jetzt das Wort übergebe, lassen Sie mich noch ganz kurz den Ablauf erläutern. Jeder unserer Sprecher wird ca. 15 Minuten referieren. Dann folgt für 20 Minuten eine Diskussionsrunde und im Anschluss daran wird für weitere 25 Minuten das Publikum Fragen stellen. Die Teilnehmer hier vor Ort können dazu die Mikrofone nutzen und die Online-Teilnehmer können ihre Fragen über Slido stellen. 
Weil wir bei der großen Publikumszahl nicht jedem das Wort geben können, haben wir entschieden intern, dass wir zunächst ähm, uns auf drei Fragen aus dem Publikum hier vor Ort und anschließend drei Online-Fragen beschränken müssen. Speech to the text. Wenn Sie eine Textverdolmetschung Verdolmetschung benötigen, verwenden Sie bitte das Tool Speech to the text, das für jedes der Focus Panels und Plenarsitzungen zur Verfügung steht. Es ist in 23 Sprachen auf der Webseite der Konferenz verfügbar. Bezüglich Slido Q&A, unabhängig davon, ob Sie im Saal sind oder die Konferenz online verfolgen, können Sie an den Fragen und Antworten teilnehmen, indem Sie den Slido-Link aufrufen oder den QR-Code an jedem Eingang scannen, der in den Dia-Shows oder auf der Konferenzwebseite angezeigt wird. Soweit meine praktischen Mitteilungen. Schön, dass Sie alle da sind. Ich freue mich auf einen interessanten und aufschlussreichen Vormittag mit Ihnen. Elina, the floor. Is yours. Thank you very much. Dear listeners, I'm very honored to be invited to this room and to be the first speaker in this first panel, which I think will be very important at this very important conference. I will begin uh, with a short story. It's a personal story. It starts in 2008. And I'm at the post office picking up a package for a friend who has broken his foot. And it's uh, kind of a problem for me. It's a bit uh, problematic because I'm also having a child with me, my firstborn, and she's only a couple of weeks old. She's quite fussy, hungry, tired, but I managed to bring my package up to the living room of my friend, and I plop down in his sofa, and I decide to uh, breastfeed my baby there. And uh, my friend, he's one of the most down-to-earth people I know. I studied with him at the university, and he was like a cliff that I could rest on when we had too many deadlines. And when I'm sitting there nursing my little daughter, all of a sudden, out of the blue, he says, I bought land because that's the only thing that will be worth anything in the future. And in that moment, all of the future crashed down on me. It became concrete and frightening, and I was looking down at this, this little life that I was holding in my arms, with slightly too big ears and no hair, but utterly, utterly beautiful. And I thought, what could I ever give you for the future? I can hardly buy the apartment that I'm living in let alone land. And after this, he told me about peak oil. And it's not as if I hadn't heard about peak oil before, but it hadn't become a part of my body yet. And in the subsequent years, I spent lots of time understanding resource depletion and climate change and biodiversity loss, and I didn't get much happier. So when it comes to growth, or maybe beyond growth, and I want to change the slide. No slides. Uh, I'm kind of an agnostic. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what it will look like. I only know that it's large scale. It has to be transformative and go deep. And it's very, very urgent. The problem is that we cannot only know what we're going from, we also have to know what we're going towards. And here narratives can be both a support and an obstacle. So it can be a support in the sense that we can see where we're going or we can get energy in the direction where we're going or that we can find agency and action in where we're going. But it can also be an obstacle in the sense that we tell us stories that it's impossible or um, that there are things that are, can't be changed or that are dead given, like a law of nature. So are we heading towards a dawn in this picture or are we heading towards the dusk? I'm not sure. In this presentation, I'm going to talk about narratives on three different levels, you could say so on different granularities. I will talk about narratives as grand narratives, or worldviews or culture that we don't really see. 
I will talk about scenarios as a way of understanding what needs to be done. And I will also talk about stories. So if we start with grand narratives, they are like the water that we're swimming in, in and that's really hard to see. They affect what we think are, is possible, um, and they are these kind of deep-held truths of our reality. But it could be otherwise, and these grand narratives are often challenged. And here I want to, for example, mention the book The Dawn of Everything by Graeber and Wengro, where they show us that uh, human social organization has been far more varied than we ever thought possible, and that the agricultural revolution actually wasn't a revolution. It took over 3,000 years, and we went in and out of growing things to eat. So it could be otherwise. Vanessa Macado de Oliveira, she says, modernity is faster than thought. Our ideas of what is natural and what is part of our modern society seeps into our brain quickly and is hard to let go of. Other things that we have taken for granted. What about the selfish gene that tells us that everything is a competition and the strongest survives? But that's not really true, is it? Science have shown us in the last couple of decades that actually collaboration and reciprocal relationship is as important and prevalent in nature. Together is also a way of surviving. Some of these ideas about what the world is is so deeply buried in our language that we don't really see them anymore. They are called root metaphors. For example, within our Western modern society, up is good and down is bad. And that might make it hard to break loose from this idea of eternal growth, because growing is good. Another root metaphor can talk about nature. So is nature a machine or something that we should conquer? Or is nature a web of life where we're part of that web and every action that we do have repercussions on ourselves as well, as well as all living things in the world? So these deep held truths about our culture and our worldview can be changed, but it's really, really hard. So, I'll move on to the next level of narratives, and I'll talk about scenarios. So the picture you see here is from the latest IPCC report, and it shows different pathways depending on how, many, how much we continue to emit. There's kind of a lack of detail here, even though this particular slide is quite detailed, and I will not go into the details of it. But really, what is everyday life in this picture? How could I know what my life would be in Sweden? And what about other places? It doesn't really say anything about Tuvalu or Sub-Saharan Africa or anything else. It's hard to grasp. I mean, there's something here, there's a red graph, and we understand that that's probably worse than the other ones. But what's really going on? These are policy-orienting scenarios, and we need them desperately. I mean, they're science-based, and they give us facts that can give us something to, to work on if we want to change the society and change the world. But I think that we forget when we look at these that we might need to do different things in different times. So there's a beginning, a beginning of change, and then we have to do some things. And there's an end of change where we have to do other things. And it's hidden in these graphs. You don't really see. It might, you might think that it's the same kind of action we need all through these years if we want to uh, not uh, get two degrees of global warming. But that's not true. We have to act differently in different times. And whose voices are not heard in this picture? 
and whose voices are heard in this picture. And honestly, I have to admit that I don't really know how to act based on, on these scenarios. What should I as an individual do faced with these scenarios? They scare me, but I don't have agency. Now I'll come back to stories. These are the nitty gritty, detailed, everyday things that we do and tell each other. And I'm going to give you an example uh, that's been quite recently. The pandemic showed us that we could uh, do much more digitally than we could before. We could use Zoom to do, give lectures if I talk about myself as an academic. Um, and we could work from home. That would mean less travel and less emissions, so that's good. And if you Google digitalization, you find picture as this. It's clean, it's neat, it's very high tech. But this is not what life looks like in general. So on this picture, you see a colleague of mine working from home during the pandemic. And he's very proud because his wife was wrong. The National Encyclopedia did come into use. Um, it's used here to prop up an ironing board. Uh, and on the ironing board, he has his keyboard and his mouse and his house cat. Uh, and the, the, sc the computer screen is, you know, put up on some kind of rickety solution with board games. So this is, this is real life. This is what actually happens. It's never very clean or frictionless. And we find solutions and workarounds and we kind of do our best to do with what we have. And this says something about who we are and what we do and what is my agency. I can solve things in stories. So, so everyday life is problem, complex, pragmatic, weird, and full of life. So in my own research, I've been working quite a lot with defamiliarizing ourselves from what is taken for granted so that we can find the agency and move forward. What are the things that are lying underneath the surface? Um, what are the everyday words that we use that actually has other types of meanings and direct our thinking in the wrong way? And I'm also very interested in which stories give us agency so that change can happen. And I want to emphasize that neither of these different levels are wrong if we talk about grand narratives or scenarios or everyday stories. But we have to move between them so that we all can understand where we're heading. And I think that very often the everyday stories are forgotten. We kind of get stuck on the scenarios and the numbers and the facts. And it doesn't give us agency. They're abstracted and agencyless. And I think that we all have to maybe collaborate in this so that we have more transdisciplinary work uh, to open up these scenarios of the future and the visions of the future so that we all can connect with them, not only with our brain and our conceptual thinking, but also with our hearts. So I'm very keen to listen to the next three speakers, and I will listen with attention. And I will listen with the attention of a living being. Maybe I'm one of the creatures in the soil in this picture, or I'm one of these children that are actually starting to wonder what kind of future they will have. I will listen as a living being, and I will wonder when the rest of the presenters present. What will my life be in your vision of the future? Thank you.
before we come to the first speaker and we speak about the three models of growth, we will do a Slido um, test. Um, so you can use um, that um, instrument in order to answer the following question. And we will do it now and in the end of the three speakers debate. So the question is what narrative is needed to guide progress towards a European Union that aims to prosper? A, green growth, B, post-growth, C, degrowth, D, other, and E, no need to change the narrative. So please participate to that in order that we have a pre and a post evaluation of your answers. Um, and we will start immediately with the first speaker. That speaker is Michael Jacobs. D. Michael, the floor is yours. Uh, well, this is a challenge, isn't it? Uh, I'm, my my uh, position on here, which is not actually my position, but I'm happy to take it on because I like a challenge. I'm at 3%, uh, I see, um, uh, which is a good challenge um, and is actually uh, good for us today. Um, I have to say, when I listened to the inspiring speakers uh, this morning and to the audience reaction, I thought, OK, I'm going in as the, uh, as the advocate of green growth here. I'm clearly the opposition. Um, uh, and I can see that uh, that appears to be true from the initial uh, Slido results. Uh, I'm normally not, uh, in fact, uh, the green growth advocate uh, in these kinds of things. But I'm very happy to be so, because I do think we need a bit of challenge today. Um, we are speaking at the, uh, in the European Parliament, and we had uh, this morning a keynote speech from the President of the European Commission, who is in many ways the most important uh, person, politician in Europe. And I'm trying to move the slides on, by the way. Um, and uh, this is a woman who uh, famously the US President used to say, um, uh, I thought there was going to be me first, yes, um, used to say, um, when I want to ring Europe, who should I ring? And the European uh, Union invented the position of European Commission President in order to provide an answer. So we have here Frau uh, Europe, and she is telling us that we need to go beyond growth and, and to achieve a new growth model. And I think we should recognise that that is a historic moment. Um, it is clearly easy for us to say, but that's not enough, and I think uh, I would certainly agree with that. But it is a historic moment uh, when the President of the European Commission is willing uh, to say that. And her speeches are written. She didn't say those things uh, off the cuff. She knew what she was saying, and I think this is a very significant moment. Uh, the question, obviously, is what would that uh, new growth model be to her? And do we want a new growth model, or do we want some other model uh, altogether? And I want to try and address some aspects of those uh, issues in my remarks. Um, so let's first establish some uh, pretty, uh, I hope, incontrovertible truths. We cannot have growth continued growth of material throughput and fossil fuel energy in our economic system. That's a fact. That is no longer in dispute. Fifty years ago, that was a surprising fact, uh, and indeed at that point it was just a projection. The Limits to Growth report, that was its core conclusion from those very primitive economic computer models which they generated, which was that we could not have uh, indefinitely material growth, including uh, energy uh, growth based on fossil fuels, and remarkably uh, those results produced from those very simple computer models have proved very, very prescient. They didn't say we had to stop growth immediately, that all these terrible impacts would occur immediately. They said within the next 100 years, and most of the modelling, most of the scenarios showed around 50 years' time, uh, and that's exactly what we're seeing today. That is a fact. So growth of material consumption and uh, fossil fuel energy is out of the question. We know why, because we can see the environmental impacts that we are already occurring at our current levels of material throughput and fossil fuel energy use. So that's clear. So anybody who says whatever they uh, argue for otherwise, that we can carry on using fossil fuels in the same way, that we can carry on growing our use of material, uh, material resources is wrong. That should be ruled out. The interesting question is, is there a way of sustaining at a healthy, ecologically healthy level uh, 
the flows of material and energy through the economy while you still have GDP growth. Now, we know another pretty incontrovertible fact that GDP is a very bad measure of, as Robert Kennedy said, most of the things we value. It's not a bad measure of one of the things that most people value, which is the amount of national income flowing around the economy. Uh, it's a pretty good measure of that. It's not perfect. We know that there are lots of activities that occur outside the monetary uh, transaction economy, which are not counted. We know that there are some difficulties in measuring certain kinds of uh, outputs and so on. Uh, uh, and so we know lots of problems with GDP. But it isn't a bad measure of, uh, of, uh, of exchange, and most of our economy, most of our economy, even when you include non-exchange uh, uh, non work, occurs within that, and mostly we like uh, that to go up. And the reason we like it to go up um, is because it generates very good things, and I think it's really important in a conference that, we, uh, that is devoted to beyond growth that we acknowledge that growth if nothing else were going on, would be good. Why? Because it gives us all these things. It doesn't automatically give us all these things. We know that it is now possible to grow and for inequality to rise. So it doesn't uh, reduce poverty in itself, but it's certainly historically been a very good way of reducing poverty. If you look at all the economies that have, in, in, in world history, from uh, the industrialization which first started in Europe through to China uh, and developing countries today, if you look at all of those that have reduced poverty in any material way, it is consequent upon economic growth. Absolutely clear historical uh, fact. Um, we know that for developed countries which are trying to provide better welfare services, particularly pensions for elderly populations, growth is very, very useful. Growth gives us the profits, let's be honest, the capitalist profits that go into the pension funds that anybody has a, who has a pension um, has, and we need them to grow in order to provide pensions, particularly when our economies are relying on fewer and fewer uh, working age uh, people. Um, and, of course, if we want better welfare benefits, if we want uh, um, uh, better public services, we want improved health services, education and so on, which we still have a lot to do, if we want to protect public goods and so on. It's very helpful to have growth. So let's not, in our determination to move beyond growth, to forget what GDP growth in general gives us. But the other thing that seems to me to be incontrovertible is when Ursula von der Leyen says we need a new growth model, let's just take the word growth out of that and say do we need a new model, an economic model? Absolutely. Because what we have in now, we can see, we, uh, already Sandrine has talked about the polycrisis, we have an economic model, a capitalist economic model based largely on neoliberal market principles which has been more or less adopted everywhere in the developed world, differing forms of it in different countries, um, which has given us a climate crisis, an environmental crisis, a crisis of poverty, a crisis of wealth inequality, a crisis of the loss of the public realm and so on. And is that model working? No, nobody would say it's working. For a Conservative politician like Ursula von der Leyen to stand up in Parliament and say that model doesn't work, which is what I heard her say, I can't see how we can, she can say we need a new model unless she's saying that. That's quite a thing because her wing of politics, broadly speaking, has been in favour of that model. So that's quite a thing for a Conservative politician to say the model of capitalism that we've been using for the last what, 20, 30 years, pretty much everywhere in Europe, doesn't work. That's quite a thing. And that seems to me to be a useful basis on which we should uh, run this conference, that a Conservative politician acknowledging that the capitalist model of the last 30 years is not working. It's not giving us the things we want. What I want to do in my uh, remaining time is to explain what a green growth version of a new model will, will need to acknowledge. There is a question, and I'm going to explain why this is, remains a question, about whether it is possible to have growing GDP, which might give us some of these things, as well as a sustainable material and energy uh, system. That seems to me to be an empirical question to which we don't know the answer because we've never uh, tried doing it. There are people who think that it's, uh, it's a logical impossibility, which I don't think is true. But I also, and this is what I'm going to say now because we've got time for some discussion, want to be clear about what you can't argue 
if you're in favour of green growth. And this seems to me very important because a lot of politicians have latched on to green growth as the easy compromise between what they've always believed, which is we need growth, and their new partial, perhaps, commitments to the environment. And green growth looks as if it solved their problem. Um, and we need to be very clear, I think, about what uh, we need here. So uh, some different ideas about green uh, growth. Um, these are my uh, names for them, but it, and I have written a bit about this, but this seems to me to be important. Most politicians and most business people, when they talk about green growth, use uh, what I would describe as a very weak version of it, in which you get growth of GDP over a period uh, in which uh, environmental impacts per unit of output decline. And by per unit of output, we, I mean um, for every dollar, euro of uh, GDP, there is a lower environmental impact uh, than uh, in, in a previous period. And most businesses now which have any kind of sustainability commitments um, uh, are essentially practicing a kind of weak uh, green growth. Strong green growth is the idea that uh, it isn't just per unit of output, but across the whole of GDP, environmental impacts will decline even as GDP uh, rises. And that's a, uh, a strong version, which is the only version that uh, we can accommodate. The problem with the weak version is as soon as there is any growth, you are liable to, uh, to see um, uh, uh, the, the uh, unit impact being outweighed by the absolute uh, impact. We've got to acknowledge, though, that a lot of the evidence that is brought up for even for strong green growth, and I'll produce some charts in a minute, is only partial. There's a lot of emphasis on what we've done to greenhouse gas emissions. So Europe, and indeed pretty much all developed countries, have now managed to decouple, we'll look at those charts in a second, um, uh, GDP growth from greenhouse gas emissions. And what those analyses tend to uh, forget is that we're not just facing a carbon crisis, we're facing a crisis across many, many different environmental indicators. And I don't think we could talk about green growth if we're only talking about greenhouse gas emissions. We also have to talk about uh, other environmental indicators. And as I shall show, they are not performing in the same way uh, at all. But in fact, what we have to do is we have to go beyond both of these. Because we know, as uh, uh, Sandrine said, that we are exceeding the planetary boundaries in many of the critical uh, uh, life support systems that the planet, the biosphere provides. And we have to ensure that we come below those tipping points and thresholds. So we have to reduce our impact, not just um, uh, at all, but to a sustainable uh, level. So what is the story of green growth so far? Well, we know that we have um, uh, in European uh, countries, um, in the developed world as a whole, I thought I'd pick the US for this chart because uh, the US is the country that has in general been a laggard. We know that we have now decoupled. Um, uh, initially, uh, we decoupled in a relative way. That is, initially, you can see that from uh, 1990, I think the, the chart starts, um, uh, the US emissions rose more slowly, the growth. But it, over the last... Uh, two decades, they have been uh, actually in decline. And uh, I put two lines on there because one of the things that immediately is said, if you say uh, there's been a decoupling of growth and, and, and CO2 emissions, people say, ah, oh, no, but we've exported all of our emissions to China. Um, uh, you mustn't only count the emissions that are produced within uh, a country. So I've got here the consumption-based CO2 emissions, which is the emissions that should be attributed to the US on the basis of its consumption. That includes the emissions that are embodied in the goods uh, and services that it imports from abroad, and they are on the decline as well. Not as much as production-based emissions, territorial emissions, but they are also uh, in decline. Um, however, globally, we are clearly not uh, at a... Uh, with, we don't have a strong green growth story at all. We have a weak green growth story. There has been a decoupling of growth rates from CO2 emissions uh, and GDP globally, um, really quite a strike, striking one. And as you can see, um, it's been levelling off for the last decade, so it's becoming flatter and flatter, but it is still growing CO2 emissions. The world is still producing more CO2 emissions. This is clearly an unsustainable path. But there has been uh, a, a weak green growth, a relative decoupling, as uh, it's called. 
Um, when we go to material consumption, so if we go beyond CO2 emissions, then we see uh, an a even weaker uh, story, which is that while global GDP has been rising quite a lot, so has, not at the same rate, there has been a, a relative decoupling, but it's really not nearly that significant across the whole of our material cons consumption. So this is a, uh, um, a material consumption indicator as a whole, um, and uh, you can see that the productivity, which is the efficiency with which we use those material resources, has been just a, bit, a little bit rising. It's been kind of flat to a, an early rise. So, uh, again, a little bit of progress, but not nearly enough to describe this um, as an acceptable, sustainable green growth path. And, of course, as we know, we are now um, uh, very close to or beyond some of the thresholds which planetary boundary analysis um, has suggested, where you get tipping points into different states, um, and we are um, uh, therefore not just interested in the direction of the, the, the lines on the chart, but we're interested in where they get to by when. It isn't sufficient to simply change the direction of the lines. We need to get to a particular point. And we're all familiar with the charts, the one that uh, uh, we've just seen, the IPCC chart. The CO2 emissions in a sustainable 1.5 degree pathway has to hit zero. And that was the remarkable shift in the global uh, climate change debate in the last 10 years, where it was accepted, and now politicians have accepted, we have to get to zero. Um, and that's, that was never true. That was never the case. When we passed the Climate Change Act in the UK in 2008, we thought we could do an 80% reduction in CO2 emissions. That was the goal we set for 2050. We now know we need to get to zero. And the acknowledgement by governments, by the European Commission, that we have to get to zero is an acknowledgement that it isn't just a direction. There's an end point that we have to get to, and we have to stay there. We have to stay at zero. This is very important. And so this is the chart that we really need to have. This is an idealised chart when thinking about what green growth means. And I am willing to entertain a politics and a political economy of green growth. I think that, it, and I will defend that in, in the discussion. But we need, we need to make sure that politicians are being kept honest when they talk about green growth. A relative decoupling of environmental um, uh, impacts, particularly just CO2, is not good enough. That does not get us to a sustainable world. Even an absolute decoupling of environmental impact from GDP growth does not get us to a sustainable world. We need to get to a sufficient absolutely decoupling where our use of resources and the flows of energy through our economic system globally are at sustainable levels within planetary boundaries. And so this is the crucial point. It isn't just the direction. It's a destination, and we've got to stick there. And we are not on that at all. And I'm grateful to Kate Rayworth for putting this um, uh, chart in such a simple way. Uh, I do have some more slides beyond that. Are they not there? Can anyone else move the slide on? Uh, ah, right, OK. So. Um, how do we do this? How can you get GDP growth with, uh, with environmental uh, impacts reduced this much? We know that there are many, many things that we can do that we are not doing. This is a circular economy. Here are a whole load of things which will reduce environmental impacts, uh, 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 it, 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 the environmental impacts of GDP. We know how to do that. We also have this in a slightly more mathematical form. Paul Ehrlich, one of the uh, uh, early environmentalists, um, came up with a, a, an, an identity. It's sometimes called the Ehrlich equation, where I equals PCT, the environmental impact is a, is a product of population, consumption, um, and the environmental impact of that consumption, which is GDP. Um, and we know that if we are, if this is true, this is a very broad identity, then every time we have GDP growth, we have to have much, much, much more environmental productivity improvement. Um, we must grow... Um, um, give, give you an example. If you have a, a, a growth rate of 2.8%, that is a doubling of GDP, global GDP, over the next uh, 25 years. That's not an un unlikely thing. Then we've got to improve the environmental productivity of our use of environmental resources uh, by 50% just to stay at the same damaging level of impact we have now. 
just to stay at the same damaging level of impact we have now if we want the global environment to improve. We have to improve uh, the way in which we use resources by more than 50 per cent. Um, we now have quite a lot of evidence. There's a good economic debate uh, about whether this is uh, likely to occur. What do we know? Well, we know that we haven't done anything like this. Um, so, so far, there is very little evidence that we, are, we uh, have been able to get on the right path. But on the other hand, we haven't tried. We've never had politicians who thought that was their purpose. And economic policymakers have never been asked to, uh, to do that. But we know there's been only a limited amount of decoupling so far. But the challenge is even bigger than this. This is a chart I like to show my students. This is uh, two charts, basically the same idea, from two different IPCC reports. The first of them from the first uh, IPCC report, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, in 1990. Uh, the second one on the right from their report on the 1.5 degree scenarios in 2018. Uh, just look at scenario D in the left-hand chart. That was the sustainable uh, scenario at which, in 1990, it was thought we would stabilise greenhouse gas emissions. Notice two things about it. Firstly, it doesn't go to zero. Even climate scientists hadn't realised at that point that we needed to get to zero. And secondly, more interestingly, look at the gradient. Look at the slope of the left-hand curve and compare it with the slope on the right-hand curve. And if you're wondering, uh, the uh, bottom axis, I've made the same length, so I'm not cheating uh, here uh, visually. We now have to do this at an extraordinary rate. Honestly, if there is anything my generation uh, can be criticised for, there are many, many things. Uh, but one of them is, why didn't you start when this, the science first told us this? If we had started to do this seriously in 1990, we could have been on that slope. And I can tell you, that would have been easier. Economically, technologically, politically, we are now being asked to do the right-hand slope, which looks very, very difficult. Um, and we're not on it. We're not on it also because, uh, as Jason said to us earlier, if we want to be serious about global equity, that is allowing the rest of the world, the non-developed world, a share of environmental resources, uh, we actually need to be on a faster slope. This is Kevin Anderson's analysis, which shows that the UK's uh, current trajectory, and the UK has a very rapid trajectory of emissions, is not the trajectory you would be on if you took the UK as a proportion of global consumption and basically you allowed every country uh, an equal level. We are still taking too many of the world's uh, resources. We should be trying to do this faster. And of course, if we were not just trying to do greenhouse gas emissions, but across our environmental footprint, uh, we would have to do this even more. Uh, WWF have tried to estimate uh, for the UK, possibly for some other countries, what our total environmental footprint is and how much we need to reduce a whole bunch of other environmental indicators, uh, and you have really very large uh, numbers. Literally, by 2030, between 40 and 90 per cent reductions in our use of various uh, environmental resources. So this is the challenge we have. Uh, we have to do this, not just production emissions, but consumption. We have to acknowledge that. Um, I will do it anyway. We can we go back to the slide? I don't know whether that's telling me I need to round up. I am nearly finished. Um, uh, we need to do this for production. We need to do this uh, across all environmental uh, indicators and not just greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we need to uh, do it uh, very, very rapidly because we are approaching tipping points and catastrophic points. And we need to do it in a way that allows other uh, nations to catch up with this. So this is the only green growth that is acceptable, it seems to me, morally and politically. Um, and this pre is, to me, the starting place that we need to, uh, to uh, start. But there is a paradox. It is without any doubt that if we had less growth, if we had less GDP flows, we would have less environmental impact. That's true. But it isn't the case that, therefore, reducing GDP will give us less environmental impact. It works one way, but it doesn't work the other. Why? Because in order to have less environmental impact, without simply shrinking the economy to a level that would not be publicly acceptable, we have to do a huge amount of investment in those techniques which reduce environmental impact in renewable energy, in demand management, in the greening of industry, in the greening of agriculture, in transport systems. That investment 
is growth producing. That investment will generate growth. Now, it may be that the things we also have to degrow, because we will have to degrow the fossil fuel economy, will, uh, that, that will definitely cut GDP. That will be its impact. But whether or not, once those two things are netted out, that scenario of rapid, rapid, large-scale investment in decarbonisation and reducing our environmental footprint will reduce GDP growth measured in GDP that is not clear. If you model this, you find that you still get uh, growth. So this is the paradox of green growth. The paradox is that there is no question that growth generates environmental degradation. But we also know that decarbonising and dematerialising our GDP will also stimulate growth. And that leads me to a simple conclusion, which is that those of us in this room who voted for degrowth those of us who voted for post-growth and those of us who voted for green growth are all on the same side for the next 20 years at least. We all want that decarbonisation. We want a new model that is not the last years of 30 years of capitalism. We want a model of the economy in which we prioritise environmental sustainability, the reduction of inequality, well-being and resilience. And we have very powerful enemies who are on the other side and they're enemies of all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael, for your first plea in favour of full green growth. A brilliant conclusion. I could write this for the end, or end conclusions. Um, and um, you were the first competitor in that ring um, between the different growth theories and growth models. We have now actually the second competitor. It's a woman. Uh, she's normally uh, connected online. It's uh, Maya Goebel um, from, from the Leuphana University of Lüneburg. Dear Maya, I hope you're there. I guess you can hear us. You're there? You're connected? She's there. So um, I didn't hear your voice. Perhaps you could... Say your word. I'll try, I'll try my voice again. It will Perfect. give away right away why nobody of you would like to sit next to me today. <laughs> so I apologize for being sick. Maya, you have the floor for 15 minutes. Thank you for doing it, even if the circumstances are not so easy for you. Thank you for that. And you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pascal. Um, well, to be giving it away right at the beginning, I'm not so sure if I'm a competitor. I think Michael kind of snug out of that competing role, and I think it is a very smart one, not to have to compete too much, but to really look at where do we want to go. What I would like to do, starting from the post-growth point of view, is to say, or pick up one or two things that Elena, you were saying in the introductory remarks, which is, why do we associate growth with good? And I think this is an important thing because growth is only a means to end. We don't necessarily want to grow ever bigger. I think all of us are okay with staying between one, maybe 50 and two meters high. If we were growing endlessly, this would not be a very good place to be as a human being. The same with trees. So everything that is natural, everything that is growing for the real proper way of uh, the word, where it's coming from, has an optimal size has something where it works well for what it would like to achieve and what is a good way for its functioning. And this is why system thinkers like to think about where are the roots, what are we really talking about? And this is where I think linking back to values, as Ms. Uh, Ursula von der Leyen was saying in the opening, is one important one. And I would like to present from the view that we are basically talking about three values that are important to societies when you look at the social sciences especially if democracy is to work. And those three values I want to tag on is security, um, is freedom, and is participation. And in all three of those, I think, unless we let go of a GDP growth narrative, we're risking democracy. Because from my point of view, the GDP growth narrative is so broken in society from three different angles that are particularly linked to those values, that unless we do that, we are really risking being able to govern into the future in democracies. And that's the point of view I'd like to take. So really talking about this from how do we steer and govern into a future 
without letting go of that <clears throat> narrative, I don't see it. And this is why it's an imperative to stick together between the ones that have seen this and are very cognizant about the fact how narratives are shaping our societies, but that we don't necessarily need new ones unless the old ones are not working anymore. Because we're sense-making creatures, where humans coordinate their activities through narratives and through key performance indicators and through metrics and through models. And the most influential language has become economics in the way that we discuss whether we're going towards progress or no. And this is why we have to look at this language when it is broken, when it is not showing us whether we are achieving our goals anymore. And so the three different narratives, or the three different ends where that narrative is broken, I think is basically very much understood by different parts of our society. And unfortunately, those different parts of society are often played out against each other. One is the ecological. It is really broken for everyone who has looked at it, and Michael just made the case again. The ecological point of view very clearly lets you see that continued growth on a fossil base with that extraction level into what the planet can provide for us is not going to work. The second story that comes from a different angle is making sure that the echelons in our society are alleviated enough from burdens will lead to their investments, will lead to the employment, will lead to the incomes that will make all boats rise. So the trickle-down effect is very much broken. Unfortunately, we see that those two are played out against each other. So we can't afford ecological measures because then the poorest will suffer from purchasing prices going up. So we have to look into what's driving this, and this is the third story that is broken for everyone who looks at what's driving that, and that is the story that what's good for finance is good for the real economy. And I think there's a strong need to push back from those that are producing, that are bringing into life the services that we need, including the ones that you talked about, Michael, and make sure that we're also talking about ex innovation, so letting go of the ones that don't serve these purposes anymore, and make sure that we show how much a financialized way of leading an economy right now is hampering that prospect. But I'd like to go into um, the three a little bit more, starting with uh, the growth story broken on the decoupling agenda. And I think it speaks to the security value when we really think about it. And this is why young people are in the streets, and this is why in Germany in particular they feel so needed to do radical interventions into the status quo, the continuing of the status quo, what we call normality, because they see the consequences, the insecurity that they're being put towards unless we are changing fast. And so how do we speak, now I'm, I'm try, really trying to put on the scientist hat, with everybody um, without antagonizing, but was really trying to invite to look at the numbers and the, the crunching and the model that we're trying to tell us where we're going. In particular, when we speak with economists that are slowly creeping forward to understanding that there might be an issue with decoupling, they say, or tend to say, well, just because it hasn't happened in the past, it's not a proof that it can't happen in the future. But then the necessary agenda very clearly is, and this is why the Green Deal is important and why the different measures are important, is to measure why it hasn't happened in the past. That is a sound, a solid, a rational answer to a diagnosis on the past. I can only speak of evidence-based policymaking and evidence-based advice if I'm willing to say, A, it hasn't happened in the past, OK, evidence uh, approved. And then B, I'm looking at the trends and the drivers of why that hasn't happened in order to formulate interventions that are far beyond the CO2 price. It's never going to be enough at all. In order for us to stand a chance that it could at all happen. And so without that empirical soundness, that rationale behind it, this is not evidence-based policymaking, it's not evidence-based advice. And I think we have to be strong on this. And then we can argue about the best measures, but unless we are looking at which measures have failed before, it's not going to happen. And to really strongly push back as well on this, oh, all of a sudden you want to have uh, well, prohibit everything. The EU right now in Germany is a huge culprit for prohibiting the fossil uh, fuel engines, uh, really prohibiting the heating systems that are based on gas. Well, seriously, we've been talking about this for 40, 50 years now. We've been going through loads, loads, loads of different cycles of intervention, from learning, from um, public information, from self-commitment, um, from incentives, etc. So if policymaking is not going towards taking the responsibility when all the other measures that we've tried before have not been enough to say then we have to regulate, what is policymaking for? 
And this is the strong uh, push that we need from society and that we need from businesses. They are seeing how things can look differently. Because otherwise, without the stock accounting, without looking at what do we actually have, how much do we have to provide for the future, this is not a sound analysis and this is not a sound answer, especially not to the young generation. And this is why freedom, I think, is a second very, very important point that we bring forward, <clears throat> because this ensuring liquidity at the top will grant the investments that trickle down is just also not working, and we've seen it everywhere. And the mentioning of Philippe Lambert of ownership, I think, is very, very crucial there, including the tracking, like um, economists Isabella Weber and others have been doing now, where are the benefits from reducing taxes on corporates, from not raising taxes on wealth, etc. Where are those going? And obviously there's a lot of evidence to be found there, especially when we're thinking about infrastructures and how those have been privatized. We see how when people depend on particular services, like housing, it's a very nice income guarantee model for the ones that are owning these infrastructures. And if the concentration on ownership is completely in the hands of five, six, maximum seven big corporations, a lot of absentee ownership comes to it, so the people owning, meaning they want to make financial returns from it, sit in a different country from where the people that need to pay to get access to it, then it becomes really difficult. And we've, I've just been in one of the lobby circles in Germany invited to speak, where you hear that language, where you hear the tyrannies of the old way of not looking at what it does to people and the real life indicators, but only to the financial indicators. There was talked about how the first thing that obviously, obviously, um, private capital allocators were looking at was the rent increase potential. That's their primary decision making whether they go into a country or no. And then Germany is now ranked as a political risk country because we're not willing to let the values flow freely where they should be going. That means something like the rent should be allowed to flow freely like they are in London, in Paris, in New York and other places where people can't find access anymore. And also these weird ideas that we might want to restrict direct access with private vehicles to houses um, because we're looking at livable spaces in cities, political risk for investors. And I think we have to be very clear that we talk about this, that we're saying infrastructure, and I'm very glad there are panels on universal basic services, are something where ownership is playing a crucial role, absolutely a crucial role, A, to who's got access to it, B, to how much do we need of it, why do people need to have four houses in different places, and then we say we have to build, build, build more, where is that supposed to go, we don't really have the space. We need to talk about allocation of resources. And this is why the freedom to have access to the basic services and the freedom to co-steer where we are going in this is fundamental if democracy is to be um, held up. And this is why we have to differentiate on that end as well. And I, I think it is important to see how much that is being debated right now as a very encouraging moment. We've seen it in the fossil fuel sector, even though we all find it outrageous what's happening there with the over um, or the, the profits made from a crisis or from a war in that matter, leading to um, payments of 62% to the shareholders of the markups that are being put on the price. And no guilt in saying, oh, we're going to scrap the decarbonization pathways that we've committed to before because it's just so lucrative right now to stay in the fossil fuel sector. Another absolute need for policymakers to intervene. And that is not destroying markets, but that is helping us to get out of structures that are not markets anymore, but close to feudalism in some of those very, very important sectors, in order for markets to all be able to work again. So we have to repair markets if they were to serve more um, the customers and the clients, etc., that we all are when we're leading our consumer lives. And the third one, the last one of participation, takes that even one further, and I think it is the most difficult one, and I think it is where we're all struggling with, because we're talking about democratic rulemaking that is helping for markets to help us get access to the goods and services, but also to renegotiate what should be conducted by markets and under which circumstances or which standards. And that is the last story, what is good for finance is good for the real economy. And that participation goes lost even more. And I never forget when Larry Fink, um, the CEO of BlackRock, was starting to issue his letters about let me see your climate risks. That was the moment where 
in whichever evening keynote speech consultation with businesses in Germany or Europe, all of a sudden everybody was alerted. Oh, now we really have to look at this. Now this is serious. And I was trying to figure out why is that? Why is none of what we've been saying before from the political side that this is necessary? Why didn't anything on that had the same effect? And it is obviously that the belief that prices won't be increased to the degree that it would actually have a prohibitive impact on some of the business models, that belief wasn't there. Because there was a belief that it could be always prevented by playing out the social against the environmental. And we see that happening big time in Germany just now on the heating law and how the law says you can't build in new <laughs> heating. That is only gas from next year onwards. It's not about ripping out everybody's heaters, but that's the way that it's being portrayed. Because for the first time, a government in Germany is trying to really crack down on the ex innovation Michael, that you're referring to, to say some business models have to go if others need to grow in order for their servicing to become more sustainable. And so why is the most important force or the most influential force private gigantic investors? On the one hand, we welcome that, and on the other hand, obviously, it's terrible because they do have another role, which is we only accept the risks when they're actually there. And from tipping point logics, that will be too late because we have to act early and not only when everybody is seeing that risks are here. And obviously, they far more often play the role of saying, no, you can't invest too much in the redesign of your value chains because that will mean the short-term slump and return on invest. So the short-termism and this delta of doom, how do we get through that? It can only work if we all collaborate between policymaking, between the financial sector, and between the productive side and the consumers that are holding this and the media that are helping telling the story and help telling this narrative and help putting out the indicators with which we're seeing where we are today, what is actually what is costing us this, and why protecting security, protecting freedom, and protecting participation is what we're after when we're talking about getting out of a growth model that is just obfuscating all of those things far too much when we're only looking at the blindfolded numbers of flowing cash in our economies. And this is why the post-growth <laughs> narrative for me maybe is the one that doesn't even put growth in its name anymore. To just say, it's been tyrannies, and we want to know whether we are on the path on a well-being society within planetary boundaries. And then the huge question for every economist is to get to what Sanjeev was saying, economic stability. How do we manage that the absolute massive amounts of cash, that's the other good, good news, there's not too, much, or too little money around. There is a lot of money around. It just goes to the wrong places. And this is why the economic stability question, from my point of view, is the one that needs to be center stage. Whilst looking at the stocks, what is the security of ecological base that we have in the future much more vividly and much more pronouncedly? And obviously, it's talking about who has the freedom to participate, who has the freedom of access to what we know is the basis of well-being, and thus freedom of speech, freedom of intervention, of participation, because we can only do that if we feel secure enough not to be risking that we're falling out of that security net. And this is why I'm not so sure if I've lived up to the notion of having to compete on the post-growth, meaning growth model, but I've tried to tell everybody why it's important to A, put growth as a means to an end, and thus let go of putting it as a pole star of the new narrative, and why an economy has to be at the service of a society, and why every democracy that wants to be built on evidence-based policymaking and regain the three areas in our societies that are really frustrated to losing trust, to becoming cynic, to becoming populist in our societies is driven into unless we do so. And this is why I think this conference is so crucial. And thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much, dear Maya. Vielen Dank für deine Sicht auf die notwendige Transformation. Uh, thank you for your argumentation about that post-growth narrative. Um, this was the second one. We come to the third and last one. This is the narrative and the arguments on and about the degrowth. And um, I give the floor to Ekaterina Cherkoskaya. Hello, everyone. Uh, very nice uh, to
to be here uh, and uh, to uh, discuss the pathways for socio-ecological transformation. So thanks a lot to the uh, organizers of the conference and this uh, panel in particular. So I would like to start by saying that uh, I really do not agree that we need a new growth model. So this is what has uh, brought the deep crisis, multiple crises uh, that we are uh, into. So instead, what we need is to go away from growth uh, at the center of our uh, economies and societies uh, and towards ecological, uh, socio-ecological transformation based on uh, well-being, uh, justice, uh, and um, uh, strive for ecological sustainability. So, and this is where the growth comes in. Uh, and I must say, I'm a bit disappointed that I haven't heard enough of it uh, so far uh, at this event, and I hope more will come. Uh, so, and I'm also happy uh, that uh, this is what brings many of us here, at least from the survey uh, that I saw on the screen uh, earlier. So that's, that's great, I think. So, uh, my role here today is to uh, introduce uh, the degrowth, the multiple vision uh, of uh, degrowth to people here uh, today. So uh, there are different definitions, uh, but also some kind of fundamental uh, agreements that uh, we share. So, and I can say that degrowth can be defined as this um, an umbrella term uh, that critiques the centrality of economic growth in today's economies and uh, societies uh, and seeks for reorganizing societies in ways which are ecologically sustainable and socially just. Uh, and here uh, I would like to uh, say that this entanglement of uh, ecological sustainability and social justice uh, is something that is very key for degrowth. So one kind of doesn't go without the other. If we push uh, for addressing the um, ecological crisis without thinking about justice, that's just not uh, going to work and that's not where we want to be uh, going. So what also degrowth means uh, is an absolute reduction uh, of biophysical throughput, so the use of uh, energy and resources, uh, whilst ensuring well-being for all. And by all, it's really like all in uh, capital letters, so we mean for everyone on the planet, so not just uh, Europe, but uh, globally. So... <laughs> So degrowth uh, has been a burgeoning research area and one can say also a um, social movement with a lot of discussion around it going on. And one of a kind of key, um, well there are two key pillars let's say of degrowth discussion. Uh, one is critiquing economic growth and another which is really has been expanding and getting a lot of uh, attention uh, over the years is uh, exploring alternatives and what alternatives could look like. So I will try to uh, unpack briefly both of those. Uh, so, degrowth argument is that uh, the perpetual pursuit of economic growth uh, is unsustainable. So, basically, what we see the evidence of, and it has been already brought up at this uh, uh, conference, is that uh, the pursuit of economic growth comes together with uh, uh, the use of uh, energy and resources and with uh, uh, environmental pressures. Uh, and the evidence of uh, decoupling at the global level, which is something that we need to address the um, ecological crisis, uh, so clim uh, climate emergency and biodiversity loss and other uh, problems that we are facing. Uh, so uh, this is something, this is the kind of global uh, decoupling which we would need, but there is simply no evidence for, uh, for this. Thanks also, Michael, for elaborating uh, on that um, earlier. So the green growth story, is that uh, kind of okay, there has been no decoupling, but we can somehow make it happen. So and it's based on several uh, ideas or kind of beliefs. Uh, so for example, there is this belief uh, in service economy and kind of uh, digital uh, economy that this is something that will bring growth without the material footprint. But actually, these economies have a huge uh, material footprint. So uh, you need, for example, for digital economy, uh, the uh, data centers, which are very kind of uh, uh, energy uh, hungry. You need massive infrastructure like undersea um, 
uh, cables to make the uh, internet connection uh, possible. Uh, you need uh, all sort of uh, infrastructure that uh, requires uh, uh, energy, materials, and, uh, and minerals. Uh, so there is uh, basically, it is misleading <laughs> to say that digital economy is what will bring dematerialization uh, to, to us. So then there is also, let's say, the discussion and some hope in the uh, expansion of renewable energy, and this is important, and this is where uh, we would agree, I think, in uh, the growth uh, kind of uh, movement that uh, this, is, this is what is to uh, expand uh, in uh, the growth uh, societies. So, however, uh, renewable energy requires also minerals and requires uh, land, and this is the land where uh, people uh, live and do other things uh, currently. So then uh, even a lot of the uh, kind of expansion of green uh, stuff has been coming with a lot of uh, dispossession and um, uh, loss for many people. So then when it comes to uh, the scenarios for addressing, say, the Paris uh, Agreement and meeting the 1.5 degree goal, so the more optimistic scenarios really are very problematically reliant on the technologies that um, do not uh, exist and also are ethically uh, problematic, like bioenergy with carbon capture and uh, uh, and storage. So, and also these kinds of technologies, apart from not operating at uh, scale, they will also come with bringing kind of more uh, hierarchies into today's societies and will make democratic decision making about these technologies very, very hard. So, and something that the growers have been bringing up uh, a lot also is the uh, rebound effect. So even if there are some kind of efficiency gains in the uh, economy, they will basically, when an economy is oriented at growth, there will be rising growth of production and consumption, in the end negating uh, these efficiency gains. So this is not also uh, enough. So hence, uh, this is this, uh, let's say, environmental critique of growth that has been very important for the degrowth uh, discussion, and I think which is where we put a very solid scientific argument that uh, decoupling is not something to, um, to look for uh, because, because it is unfeasible and that we should simply look for an alternative uh, organizing of our economies. So, however, degrowth is not just about uh, decoupling, so this pursuit of uh, growth, it also comes with a lot of uh, injustices. So you can look here at the environmental justice atlas that maps the different conflicts uh, around the world uh, in the uh, pursuit of growth in capital accumulation. So, and these are not all the conflicts, these are just the ones that are on the map. And we can also see here the um, unequal exchange between the global north and the global south, so something that has already been mentioned uh, today, with a lot of kind of a, a so-called imperial mode of living and this uh, consumerist way of living uh, in the north depending on extraction and violence and dispossession uh, in the south. So apart from this, also if we look at uh, Europe, there are also many environmental uh, justice conflicts within Europe itself. And overall we can see that there is this, well, there is assumption that uh, growth somehow uh, will bring the uh, benefit to all and its uh, uh, good effects will trickle down, but it's not really what has been happening. So since around the 80s, the uh, growth, it has been trickling down to the, to the richest uh, groups in the society. So, and with the uh, um, the 99 percent, so uh, people have been suffering uh, dispossessions, uh, austerity, and the very negative effects of growth or recessions in growth-focused um, economies. So, and we also see a global trend of inequalities rising uh, in, in societies. So there are many of these uh, aspects where basically a uh, green growth story would think that growth would deliver, but it is not something that we see. So now the growth what does a degrowth uh, alternative look like? So this can be said as to be a vision for socio-ecological transformation. And here I also stress the air vision, 
uh, because it is not some kind of ideal that is to be imposed uh, on everyone else. It is one of the alternatives out there. So, and here, the growth uh, uh, movement and the growth scholars, uh, we are in uh, uh, dialogues and alliances with the pluriverse of alternatives around the world, many of which also come uh, from the global south and show how a uh, living uh, away from growth, not dependent on growth, uh, is uh, possible and desirable and, uh, um, um, and very, uh, yeah, uh, full of uh, well-being too. So the image here demonstrates uh, kind of the, what we talk about when we discuss the growth. So it is not this kind of huge elephant that the economy is uh, today, no offense to the elephants, so, but it is a snail uh, that moves kind of uh, uh, slower and at a, at a good pace uh, and uh, focuses on um, well-being and sustainability instead. So, and also it is important to say that the growth is not about kind of uh, delivering deliberately cutting GDP. So it is not about uh, recession, and recession is a consequence of growth-focused economies. Um, and also the growth has nothing to do with austerity, which is another consequence of growth-focused economies, which comes when a crisis hits. And actually, my kind of uh, academic life, and uh, maybe activist life to some extent, is really associated with this uh, constant waves of austerity. So since 2008 uh, financial crisis, this is the only kind of facet of growth <laughs> uh, focused economies that, uh, that I have seen, and I don't really see uh, another um, uh, possibility for, uh, for that story. So uh, then it is important to say what the growth uh, offers, let's say, apart from uh, critique. So the growth is about living well within limits, uh, so within the planetary boundaries, but also societal boundaries. So it is important to uh, live uh, not at anyone uh, else's expense. Uh, expense. So, and in uh, the growth, so we um, stress other values than what are key in the economies uh, and societies today. So care, uh, conviviality, democratic, direct democratic decision making, uh, mutual aid. Uh, so these are some of the key words uh, in the degrowth vocabulary. So the idea for the societies is to provide level um, well-being uh, for, uh, for all uh, and to ensure provisioning systems uh, that uh, enable that well-being. So, and this is what economy should be about. So it should not be an end in itself, but a means to ensure good uh, levels of, uh, uh, of well-being. So uh, then when it comes to the economic kind of models and organizations, so today really corporations and for-profit enterprises are so key uh, in uh, economies. So they really drive the whole kind of green growth agenda. The lobbying uh, of corporations is so much present in institutions like the um, uh, European, uh, European Commission. So when, for example, frameworks like the uh, European Green Deal are, um, uh, are being uh, implemented. So, so this is a problem and this is not where we see the power uh, as degrowth scholars and degrowth movement. So the power is in both bottom-up uh, bottom transformation, uh, and here there are many organizations uh, and kinds of organizing that can drive this transformation. So we speak, for example, of not-for-profit um, organizations as key to a degrowth economy. So, for example, based on cooperative uh, principles or community organizing or commoning. Uh, and, but at the same time, it is important to drive change at all levels. So it is important for institutional change and policy change also come in and help these alternatives to flourish or support these alternatives. So one may say, when you present a degrowth vision, that okay, it, doesn't it sound a bit utopian? Uh, does it really exist? And the thing is that there are really many alternatives uh, out there already. So. Um, there are, for example, renewable energy cooperatives uh, with about 2,000 uh, around Europe that are already driving the transition to renewable uh, energy. There are the um, uh, global 
eco-village uh, network uh, organizations or the uh, Via Campesina uh, movement that show how agroecology and how uh, food uh, provisioning can be done without depending on uh, problematic agri-food systems. So there are also uh, examples of digital commoning, for example, about uh, uh, enabling plastic recycling uh, locally and sharing the kind of uh, knowledge on the infrastructure uh, to, to be able to, to do this. So, so you name it, and wherever you are, you would be able to find different alternatives of different kinds that you can be uh, part of. So, so there are really many alternatives. They might seem small when you look the, kind of, uh, at them, but actually when they unite the net network, so when you see them uh, mapped like this, there are, there are many. So, but the problem is that they are barely noticeable uh, in policymaking uh, today, which kind of largely uh, avoids uh, them and perhaps pursues the lines which are driven by for-profit um, enterprises. So, hence, this is where also these alternatives really are suffering a lot in times of crisis, when the energy prices are uh, rising, when there is overall rise in the cost of uh, living. So it's really uh, fragile to be doing uh, something alternative within the economy. And this is where we need transformative policy making, and this is what I hope that this conference is going to help and drive us towards. So when... Um, we speak of the growth policy making, perhaps I could identify uh, at least three dimensions uh, of that. So on the one hand, it is about stimulating a different kind of economy, uh, which means phasing out destructive fossil-based uh, growth uh, oriented uh, production uh, and supporting these uh, uh, small scale alternatives uh, to, uh, to spread and to scale wide, something that is also uh, referred to in the growth, this term, instead of scaling up and conquering the world, scaling wide uh, across, uh, across the world and uniting in networks. So it is also important to push for kinds of policies that enable a basic level of uh, well-being, uh, which would also give the kind of freedom and the space to do things differently. So such as the universal basic services, which I think is discussed in a parallel uh, session at this very moment, uh, or universal basic income, green jobs guarantee, so some of the ideas that have been uh, mentioned already. And of course, a third dimension for uh, policy making that is in line with the growth principles uh, would be to uh, ensure that this well-being and uh, sustainability uh, within uh, Europe uh, is not brought at the expense of, uh, of others. So uh, hence, uh, the cancelling of uh, um, debts uh, and curbing unequal exchange are also key dimensions uh, of a transformative uh, degrowth oriented policy making. So, and I think I will leave it here. Thank you. Thank you all speakers. Uh, it has been very interesting listening to you. Actually, I'm going to do something that we didn't say I would do. But we've been in here for one and a half hours and we're all living beings with bodies. I would suggest that all that are able to actually stand up and stretch maybe, shake a bit. Yeah? Thank you. Now you can listen with attention again. <laughs> I hope, is Maya still with us? Do you, is she? We had planned a dance. Now we did only the stand up. But oh, sorry. <laughs> to, yeah, to, no problem. Huh. Um, is, is Maya going to be on the panel online or is she? Normally she should, Maya. Yes, Maya is there. Now I see her. Hi, Maya. Um, right. I had a couple of questions that were sent to you in beforehand. Uh, and I will keep to those questions, but I m might not take them in the order that you got them. Um, I think my first question would you, to you would be to ask you what shifts in cultural or worldview do you think need to happen for your vision to come to fruition? 
So what kind of shifts in worldview? What are the biggest obstacles that you're facing with your vision? And I'm going to give the floor to Maya first because she's, she can't really wave and take the microphone. No, thank you very much. Um, well, I think one of the ones that are really crucial is the one that you've basically just mentioned, to recognize that we are biological beings. And I find it interesting how often we tend to forget this. Um, and we're, A, embedded in what we call environment, as if it was only around us, but not part of us and within us quite often, <laughs> in terms of the air that we breathe, the water we drink, the nutrition we take in, etc. And to understand that that has a particular rhythm. Um, so acceleration is not necessarily progress once it's gone beyond that optimal uh, rhythm where life can actually regenerate itself. So that would be A1 in the world view, to go from acceleration as an ideal to rhythm. And the second one is to get from parts to partaking, to really understand that we're not isolated from each other and that also nature, you can't just chug out different pieces and put them somewhere else and it will regrow in the same way. But to understand that we are partaking, so it's networks, um, and everything that we do will create a feedback to others and we're going to receive a feedback from that. And that this is a way um, of a systems view on the world that can help us understand how the balancing out and uh, the regeneration can work, but also to understand that we do have an effect. So we are partaking in all of this and we should take voice. And that's the third one that I would like to draw to you, which is you have to replace money with value again. That was the thing that I was trying to get to, that we really understand what are means and what are ends. And money is the most fascinating social technology we've brought to life, maybe, as human uh, species. And it's purely based on contracts. It's purely based on state interventions, as last illness. It's purely based at, on a relationship, basically, that we've sealed into some different variations of laws. So we can really change it and make it that energy for us that can service the three other points so that we get from extraction to regeneration. Thank you. Michael? I'm very skeptical of the argument that we need to change our values, um, and that's how we will get to a sustainable, well-being-focused economy. We definitely do, but value change has tended to be slow. It's tended to be very, very difficult to direct, um, we don't really know how it happens. Uh, I wouldn't trust any NGO or politician to tell me how you change values. What I do know is what is in our control, which is politics, and that's how we will actually do things at the speed that we need to do them. We've got a decade to radically shift the nature of our capitalist economy, and we will do that through the behaviour of governments. It isn't small community renewable projects which are driving the renewable energy revolution. It's capitalist companies deploying vast amounts of global savings under the direction, pretty much now, of public policy, of public policy by governments who are elected, and they're elected by the public, and that is the thing that people need. That is, the, If there's a value change, it's a belief that politically we can change the way in which the capitalist system works. That is the only way we're going to do this in the time available because we're not going to overthrow capitalism in the next 10 years, but we can redirect it and we have already started to do that in significant ways. That's why we have a renewable energy revolution already. They're not doing this, the capitalist companies, because they like it, because their values have changed. They're doing it because it's profitable. Why is it profitable? Because we've changed the regulatory and pricing systems to require them to do it and they found they could make money out of it. So the value change, if there is one, is about is agency, is a belief that democracy, politics works, that if we work together with our fellow citizens on political projects, whether we do that through parties or we do that through pressure on parties, which many of us feel more comfortable with, that we can redirect this system, this gross wealth extracting system that we face. Um, and that's the value that I would like to see. The thing that, that the, the value that is most corrosive uh, is apathy, is the belief that we can't change anything and that there isn't any point in doing this and that all we have to do and, and in some people that has been a retreat into all we have to do is to change our own personal values well yes but get out on the streets as well
Yeah, so I think I can connect to, to what Michael kind of finished uh, with, in the sense that when we're asked about the worldviews, there is a typical story that, okay, but actually people, they want to consume, they want all these uh, uh, benefits of a growth-centric uh, uh, economy. So, but I think this is really a very wrong presentation of that story. So I think that already when we look at the um, many people out there, many, uh, uh, especially in the young uh, generation, so we see a strive for something else. Uh, so, and there are many, um, say, climate movements, uh, environmental justice uh, movements, the various sustainable materialism movements, they are arguing for the uh, radical change and they already have a different worldview uh, out there. So perhaps the worldview of the uh, super rich uh, definitely needs to, uh, to change and be challenged. Um, so, but, uh, but I think what I would like also to stress is that sometimes the kind of um, uh, let's say the consumption that many of us are stuck in is very much uh, comes from a particular menu uh, of alternatives and there are not uh, enough alternatives which are sustainable and just at the same time. So I think that it is important to change the world use but it is also very important to uh, um, fight for other power relations because these are particular uh, interests that keep the growth uh, so centric in our uh, societies. So, and in their worldviews, so they want their profit to grow. So, profit is their uh, worldview. So, in that sense, I think that, uh, and it is very hard to change the corpor corporate worldview to go away from profit. So, and this is where we need very ambitious, transformative policy making to listen to the voices of the uh, multiple social movements. Uh, and the bottom-up uh, alternatives out there and drive this uh, change. Thank you. I will ask a question that's not on the paper. Oh. I'm allowed? Yes. Sure. Um, imagine you three um, would be Ursula von der Leyen uh, next week and you can decide on what will happen in Europe in the, within the 27 member states on Monday uh, in seven days. That will happen. You can implement your growth model in Europe within seven days. And it will be implemented and it will be there. But, there's always a but, China, India and the United States won't apply the same rules, won't apply the same logic. What happens then? Michael or Maya, okay. perhaps. Good, yeah. good question. Much better to have ones that weren't, we didn't prepare for. Um, so, um, uh, so one needs to be careful about this because the US is now pushing more quickly on the green industrial agenda than Europe is, and Europe has got a bit anxious about this, partly for defensive reasons, because uh, American subsidies, which are now huge, huge volumes of subsidies, uh, which are now going into uh, green technologies uh, and green consumption, are going to take European companies uh, away from Europe and into the US, and less similar kinds of subsidies can be offered in the EU. And Ursula von der Leyen, to her credit, has reacted very quickly, and we've now got new initiatives trying to uh, restore this. So, you know, if, if I were in the position uh, of advising Ursula von der Leyen, I'd be saying, uh, don't do something that America isn't doing, do something that America is doing. Um, and do it in consultation with your trade unions as well as your businesses, because we need to make sure that this is a just transition uh, that we are doing. And, but uh, invest in the green companies, technologies, and production processes, which will decarbonize uh, and which will decarbonize Europe and which will uh, uh, create uh, new jobs, uh, particularly in the peripheral parts of Europe, and engage in green trade deals with African countries that want to supply the minerals and to supply uh, the component parts and so on. We've already got new little processes which have uh, begun to emerge called JETPs, Just Energy Transition Partnerships, with South Africa, with Indonesia, Indonesia, with Vietnam, and there are others in the pipeline, where Western countries, including the EU, um, are trying to do effective investment partnership deals with developing countries to help them get off coal, because it isn't our consumption of fossil fuels which is now driving climate change in, in Europe. It's the consumption of f rapidly growing countries, particularly those that are dependent on coal. It is absolutely astonishing that South Africa and Indonesia, two coal-based countries, are saying, we want to stop 
using coal, but we need help to do it. We should be encouraging them, providing more investment than we are, and doing trade deals with African countries. I've been talking to some African countries who are very keen to engage in green trade relationships which are not unequal exchange uh, with Europe. So I would be saying let's accelerate the process that the United States has, uh, has started of pushing down this green industrial road. Let's do it in a way which provides good jobs, decent jobs, well-paid, unionized jobs all across Europe. Um, and let's, let's offer a vision to European people that this is something that will generate prosperity, greater well-being, greater equality, um, and as well as doing well for the environment, and show them that this is a hopeful future that uh, we can aim for. And in doing that, get rid of the debt limit that limits the uh, European budgets, which the, the legacy of Maastricht, which is a, uh, a ridiculous constraint. We need a little bit more Keynesian stimulus. The European system needs to acknowledge that. So we've got some very specific things you should do. Um, but this is where we can provide some hope, not of some idealized utopian future, but of something that can make a difference to people's lives now. And I'll tell you what, if they go for it, they'll get re-elected afterwards. Maya, du möchtest, äh, du wirst ähm, ähm, gewählt, um übermorgen Post-Growth umzusetzen und äh, du darfst alles entscheiden, damit es so umgesetzt wird. Was passiert dann ähm, in den Bereichen und in den Kontinenten dieser Welt, wo das nicht geschieht. Und daran möchte ich immer auch gerne so ein bisschen die Frage nach der Wettbewerbsfähigkeit unserer Wirtschaft knüpfen. Gehen wir dann hier unter oder gehen wir auf? Mm -hmm. Well, first I would like to issue my surprise that economists on a panel are differentiating value from economic metrics, measurement, pricing, etc. Because all of that is full of value judgments. And this is exactly where we need to get at. Right? And this is exactly where we have to have a deliberate democracy that makes people understand this. It's not objective, neither are markets objective, neither is pricing objective, neither is it falling from the skies, it's being done by human decision making. And this is why I would really, really like for us to also not go into differentiating the value change from changing all of those metrics and all of those guiding uh, frameworks that we've issued. And this is where I would go for. I would really try to tell a rich and diversified story of where are we now? This is going to be a shocking moment. Um, and then to say how each of the different interventions is helping us to regrow some of those values that we've differentiated. And the well-being ones were just being mentioned. And they are in the treaties. The well-being of its people is the Article 3 in the treaties. And that includes future people on this continent. And so how do we make sure that we have progress indicators that are allowing for us to get out of this fear of everything being lost into a, we are rebuilding what we have deprived or destroyed because we have been blindfolded, because we have not had value expressions clearly on the table, but only monetary um, indicators that were not letting us see what's happening on the ground. And this is where then obviously you do start, and I do think I, there I'm totally with Michael, I think this whole notion of where do we need to put our emphasis is really to look at how do we get into better relationships with the continent that is right next to us, and how do we make sure that there we're also going into a totally different way of driving those relationships because migratory patterns is the, are the ones that are going to be met or that Europe's going to meet. So unless we find a way that our way of doing uh, economy and provide or needing resources, but also providing technologies and getting into relationships with the neighboring continent is going to be determinant on a lot of other levels that we're not even talking about when we're talking about security now, but we should. And this is why I do think that this is crucial also when you think about the geopolitical shifting when you uh, look at how much China and Russia have been doing that and have been influential on that continent. That is something I would really, really emphasize right now, but be sure that we do it in a way that makes it a mutual uh, beneficial way and get out of the superiority complex that we are the ones that are giving them, but understand that we are totally dependent on them. And this is why the notion of how do we find security in the future can only be on really making sure that we're cutting down as much as we can on the overconsumption and the overproduction that we need for people to live well here and to make the best quality for our industry in terms of products and services, also including benefits as a service, so the circularity aspect being crucially important there. 
and doing it in a way that we are looking at other things like a four-day work week, etc. as well, even though right now, obviously, the discourse says, are you crazy? Because in Germany, we have far too little people, right? So we're shifting in this whole, oh, can we find jobs through the green transformation? Something's waiting to be broken into, oh my God, where do we find people? Because everything is understaffed. So how do we use that moment and prepare for that being a backlash argument against some of the social benefit um, arguments that we're making here? Because right now the notion is it will come breaking down unless people work even more. So the exploitation not only of nature but of people is totally on the front pages right now as the necessity in order to stabilize our economy and our ability to compete with China and, and the US. I don't know um, how exactly you will be able to tell the EU that it is going to be better uh, necessarily a, a strong argument in terms of China and US won't overtake us, but I think the notion that Europe can overtake China and the US by following the same model that they're doing is completely naive. So it's an open story, but the size of who's talking with whom, who's dependent on who right now. It's just making that a completely naive and not very realistic outlook. So instead of going for a zero sum competing until the planet's dead and over exploiting our people, it has to be that gutsy moment to say we can show that it can be done differently and then hope that it will have a very positive effect also on geopolitical pressures because we don't need to depend so much on other people's territories anymore and they can have more access to what they happen to be living on. We can't promise it's going to work. I think that would also be just wrong, but it is the only way, I think, for us to have a perspective that can actually work. Thank you very much. <laughs> Fully agree, agreeing on that, and we have the last intervention of um, Ekaterina, and we will go to the Q&A for the public. Yeah, afterwards. so I totally agree with uh, what uh, Maya finished on here. So instead of pursuing this kind of zero-sum game, go uh, ahead with it, and uh, uh, then hopefully a larger transformation would follow and go with courage. So that's what I would say to Ursula von der Leyen, and I would be short here. <laughs> Perfect, I will tell her. Um, we make the Slido um, questioning a second time, so please feel free to do that in order to have perhaps another result than before, and it is slightly different uh, than before. Michael, you have not convinced at all. <laughs> but this is not, um, this was not um, the aim of the, that, of that exercise. So we will have now Q&A from the room, um, and we will provide, um, so, there are there was one young lady in the middle of the room so i give you the floor you push the button to yes to push the button and you ask or perhaps and you define the person yeah Perfect. thank you for saying young lady i wasn't sure um so uh my my question goes to michael michael you're a brave man um my name is laura sullivan i'm from we move europe it's a campaigning organization that works on anything from deep sea mining to migrants to workers rights and um Maya asked the question at the beginning of why is it that we associate growth with good? I think one of the reasons is that very influential people such as yourself continually turn up at fora like this and give very misleading and dangerous statements such as GDP has reduced poverty over time. Now that very much depends on what you mean by poverty because if you mean the $2.15 per day that the World Bank sets down then fine, granted. But anyone I've ever spoken to about poverty who themselves lives in poverty has said that in fact it is the power and the capability to have some sort of say over your life. And in those terms GDP has not changed anything. In fact the only thing that's growing is inequality. You did not mention redistribution. You did not mention power. I'd like to know your definition of poverty and I really worry about the idea of rising tide lifting all boats because all those boats are on fire right now. Michael, you should and could answer. Um, great. Um, just, just so that people know, if you want to know what I think about these things, read some of the stuff I've written, because obviously we can't talk a lot about this, and I think you'll find that I'm not where 
people kind of assume that uh, I am. So let's be very clear. Um, if you have been living on uh, a couple of dollars a day, um, you're a Chinese peasant uh, 20 years ago, and you're now uh, beginning to enter a, um, a, 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 a kind of life in which you are now on 25, 30, 50 dollars a day, you're better off. And every Chinese person who's been through that experience would say the same. Um, and if you are a family that lived in a slum in the early 1950s and you now live in a decent uh, house, you would say you're better off. That doesn't mean that we've abolished poverty, because obviously relative poverty is exactly the things that you say. Um, but really, 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 let us not, as comfortable people who can afford to come to a conference like this, so we're all comfortable, I suspect, in this room, tell people who are on low incomes that more income does not benefit them. Because it just isn't the case. And there are hundreds of millions of people around the world whose lives have been improved over the last 30 years because they've got more money. Now, that doesn't mean we've abolished poverty, because poverty is always relative, so there will always be, as long as you've got deep inequalities. I care deeply about inequality. You didn't hear me talk about it because you didn't hear. I said there are four goals that we need as a society to get beyond growth. They are environmental sustainability, the reduction in inequality, well-being, and system resilience. And I wrote a, a report for the OECD about that. That's why I'm here at a beyond growth pa um, panel, because I don't think growth is the objective. What I said was, there are benefits of GDP growth, and if we simply ignore them, then we will not speak to the vast mass of the public who know that a bit more income is good. And we need to be elected. Philippe is here as an elected politician. The reason he can do anything here is because he's been elected. That's why and unfortunately, there are not more people like him because we've not persuaded people to vote in enough numbers for people who believe with Philippe, and I'm very close to Philippe in my, in my positions. So what I'm saying is, let's not, because we want an alternative world and we want a non-capitalist or a, a church system, forget to speak to the people out there who are voters because they need convincing, because otherwise we will not do this. We will not do this unless we have elected politicians in charge of the state making policy which forces those capitalist companies to behave in ways that they don't want to behave. So that, if that is my position, that is my position. I absolutely believe in a reduction in equality. I don't think growth is a useful narrative. It doesn't give us what we want, but don't think that there aren't people who we need on our side who don't think a bit more money would be nice. Thank you, Michael. That young lady, dear. You have to push the button. If it doesn't work, you have to push the button next to you. Then it works. No. Okay. Yes. No, 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 no. It works. It now, works? Oh, works. Oh, maybe I was holding it. Okay. So, um, first of all, thank Move you. Move the mic down closer. Okay. Thank you so much for the um, presentations, by the way. I really enjoyed it. I'm actually doing my thesis on climate justice at the moment. And I have a question on actually both sides of the debate in terms of like um, continuing with GDP and this narrative on like market based approaches and also then talking about value. Because from the critical approaches, there, there, you, you, there's a lot of talk about value and repositioning ourselves within nature and this is also kind of in line also with degrowth and stuff like this. Um, but a lot of it is, uh, a lot of the critical approaches just provide criticisms and theoretical ideas of what might work, whereas with the kind of capitalism status quo and the we only have 10 years to do this, so we have to stay along the same trajectory and try and work within the paradigm we're in. Honestly, I did not say we need to stay on oh, the same I'm, trajectory or status quo. No, I didn't, I didn't mean, I'm sorry if it came across wrong. I guess that from what I've perceived right, that there's... We are within a current paradigm and to shift it to the point where we're looking beyond money as a form of value is not super realistic in the time frame we have. So I guess the question I'm asking is, is there like both sides of the argument don't really seem to give me an answer of like tangible solutions that we can actually apply that go beyond kind of theoretical assumptions of what might or might work, might not work. I don't know. Is that clear or not? Um, I'm not a professor, so I give the floor to, <laughs> to, to those who want to reply. Michael, Ekaterina, Maya. 
right now? <laughs> Maya. Okay, thank you. No, I think the, the important aspect really is transparency. This is what I was trying to get to in the interventions in order to get the support for changing what is being put into monetary equations, etc. That's the whole notion. We've had a long debate about, and I've seen some of the leading figures like Bob Costanza in the room, how do we value nature and show how much it is providing for us without it necessarily commodif uh, pushing for a commodification trajectory? And I think it is the conundrum that we're facing right now. Because as soon as you start expressing the value of something, the urge for the surplus capital that is there, it, just, it feels so wrong, but there's too much money floating around the globe right now that looks for a financial return on invest. And the assets that people depend on are the most secure rent providing things to own. And we have to face the fact, and this is where right now we're looking at biodiversity, how can we protect it, how can we create revenue for the ones that are actually helping for the soils to stay healthy, helping to regrow what we have as natural value and capital. And then what does that mean for ownership? There has to be a very good way of understanding that we map, especially for rent-seeking uh, purposes, who does what, who earns what, and why, because that is the notion of, at least if it's going to be a market that is going to um, govern some of those, how markets can it all uh, work. And the whole economic theory is based on at least some degree of information about the things that really happen. And we've voided that information out of uh, the pricing system to a large degree. And at the same time, we do have the problem that unless we're also looking at governance structures like trust funds, like public-private public people partnerships, so not just public-private, like we've seen that led to the ownership of the fundamental asset for universal basic services, there are rent guarantees. And we see it that then the public has to print money in order for poorer people to be supported, they go straight in the piggy bank of the ones that are owning this. And this is where the democratic uh, um, contract is broken, especially when the owners sit somewhere else. And it is our governments that are having to print the money that can, they could use for a load of other things that are more investment and productive rather than propping up the rent seeking of the ones sitting elsewhere. And this is why I think looking at finance and the financial markets and how finance is driving us out of the trade-in solutions between social and environmental goals into fostering a trade-off agenda, that's exactly where it is hard for politi uh, um, political decision-makers to hold the narrative, to not have it played out against each other. And this is why we have to be so strong on showing what is hiding behind those numbers and those narratives. Not only growth, productivity, value, creation, um, et cetera, et cetera. You have a lot of those guiding one's return on invest um, profit that we should be looking at and say where is money helping and where is it going the wrong way because it is the strongest force we have right now especially if we look at short termism perfect thank you Maya Short reply from Michael. Short reply from Michael. So I th we need to be very careful about the we here. Maya says that she was surprised that I said we don't need to change values or, or, or whatever. Let's be very clear. When Maya says we need to do this, she's talking about a, 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 a relatively small group of economists, business people, some politicians who believe in concepts, who know what concepts of productivity, of economic growth um, uh, are. The vast majority of people don't believe those things. They value nature. They value well-being. They value their friendships and health and so on. They don't think like economists. And yes, of course, we need to change the, the values of, econo of, e the, of economics. And I would completely agree with that. I'm not a mainstream economist at all. But let's not think that because our society is run and our economy is run on the values of economists and business people, that's how the majority of people think at all. On the contrary, the majority of people are humanitarians and most, many of them now have become environmentalists. So when I say we, I'm not talking about economists and business people, I'm talking about uh, ordinary people, and I think ordinary people are much closer to where the conference is today. Uh, and so that's just the distinction between those two we's. There is an elite economist business we need, needs to change completely, all those things that I agree, agree with. There's a public we which is much closer to where, where this conference is in my view. Thank you, Michael. Um, last question from the, from the room. We had now two answers from two different panelists. Perhaps a question to Ekaterina. Yes, but we should have a man asking a question because I have now, yeah. we should be gender balanced. There is a man who will ask a question to Ekaterina. Perfect. Uh, 
Oh, now you hear yeah, me? Perfect. Okay. Um, a question, I'm an economist, I apologize. <laughs> um, no, I think economy is, is very important. It's about redistribution, it's about taxation. Uh, so, uh, and on this point, on taxation and richness, we come from a time before the 80s. Uh, you had progressive taxation in the United States up to 80%. Um, is more taxation and more redistribution a no-brainer, is my question, because if you tax the richest, the most uh, consumptions comes from the, but the I think the 10 percent uh, richest uh, consume 30 percent of uh, materials and uh, have the same percentage of uh, CO2 e emissions. So it's uh, more taxation of income, more progressive taxation of income and taxation of uh, uh, wealth income, uh, especially is this uh, a no-brainer. So yes, all of them are needed. Uh, definitely there should be more taxation of the rich. Uh, there should be more taxation, uh, much more of the uh, environmentally destructive uh, activities. And in uh, the growth kind of uh, spaces, we, we discuss, for example, policies such as uh, maximum income uh, or uh, the uh, yeah kind of maximum uh, wealth. So this is something that uh, is uh, one of the important ways uh, forward, uh, I would say. But also maybe apart from mentioning t taxation, which is uh, yeah and radical redistribution, that's also something that we do need. Maybe I can also say that uh, it is important to stop subsidizing a lot of the destructive activity because this is what happens today with the financial uh, flows, which are directed very much at. Uh, kind of fostering the very activity that uh, is um, perpetuating the uh, climate emergency, biodiversity loss, and, uh, um, and other crises of today. So we have questions that came from online, and uh, due to time, we're only going to post two of them. But my first, the first question will be posed to you. Katerina, degrowth will require different narratives of what is a good life. How to get this shift attractive to mainstream of societies caught in consumerism? So I think this is something that I partially have addressed. So I think that it is wrong to think that it's really like we're caught in consumerism because I think that often we are not, we do not have the um, space to make different choices because the choices come from this consumerist uh, menu. And also a problem is that, that of course we often lack the understanding of how things are produced and how, uh, where they come from. But we have now much more of it. So I think that consumerism is definitely part of the uh, problem, uh, but there is definitely the productivism that is there, so this perpetual expansion of uh, production that also then drives consumption and wants us to consume more, wants us to change the uh, phones uh, every, uh, every three years, uh, makes plant obsolescence part of the design of the, uh, of the products. So I think this kind of productivism uh, also, yeah, that is fostered through aggressive uh, advertising. So this is something not to be forgotten when we are discussing in consumerism because they are part and parcel of the same um, problem. So, and when it comes to the stories of good life uh, without growth, so we definitely need more of those. There, there are many of them uh, already, but definitely kind of the idea of, let's say, uh, sticking to the language of decoupling. So decoupling uh, the very idea that, uh, uh, of well-being uh, from uh, growth is still uh, important. Thank you very much. Do Second question we already answered too, and I come to the last question of today is the fourth one. Only about 50 to 20 percent of people think the same way as the idea of the conference. Perhaps, how are we going to change the actual model and remain democratic? A question to Maya and to Michael to conclude shortly. Or do you want to go with Michael? No, you go first. Okay. Um, well, I think that it is a lack of transparency that is holding people back from uh, wanting to see the changes. And it is linked that I think 
um, Michael, that you actually pointed to, where experts and policymakers have a duty to show the steering effects of the status quo. I think one of the biggest challenges right now is to shift the burden of proof onto the status quo, because what we call normality is completely not normal. <laughs> it's a high-risk society globally. And as long as we keep on using indicators that are blind to this, people will say we want to maintain this normality. But as soon as we are more openly communicating where the risk zones are and who is taking what kind of risk right now and why changing is actually positive in a lot of, lot of, lot of areas of well-being. There we also don't have to go for what people instinctively say, and I think they would also not necessarily need to buy everything if it wasn't told to them by the marketing uh, uh, messages that are now infiltrating our subconsciousness through our social media devices, so the very asocial ways of using those possible technologies right now. And if it wasn't uh, so much ingrained in the way that we talk about success and who's made it. I mean, the whole discourse there, we're talking about narrative of who's made it, who's a role model, who's earned it, and who's providing it right now. Again, we have it, oh, the tech space, uh, and is redistribution working or no? Who is actually providing and earning and making all of that money that can then be redistributed? We have to be there as well to say, and that's the redistribution or pre-distribution agenda, obviously, to say, why are these earnings so different between different sectors in the first place, that this superiority complex can come around, that the ones that happen to have more negotiating power and thus take home more money are then looked at in a meritocratic, meritocratic way, per se, without us asking who's doing what, who's earning what, and why. And this is why it's a democratic uh, process to open up all of those judgments that are coming as normality, that are being replicated in the discourse to allow for participation in challenging this, including this, we always want more stuff. I mean, when you think about it, it's such a desperate way of looking at yourself. You can't ever get enough. You're this kind of Pavlovian dog. Everybody that wiggles a car in front of your face is going to make you run after them. Come on. I mean, it's a, it's a to totally boring story. And also, one economist again, sorry, um, Mr. Kahneman, who's won a Nobel Prize for it, is so clear that it's not about having a lot of stuff, but it's about the experiences connected to it. So if we're much more putting out what we're losing in high-quality experiences right now by being overstuffed with uh, loads of things in the day, over-consuming, over-exploiting ourselves because the productivity after I is again... Health is a very important angle on this one. And it's a huge connection between environmental or planetary health and um, people's health, both in the way that we can reduce the poisoning of our bodies, and, but also reduce the overconsuming and change our diets that will help both. So it's always about the trade-in narratives, I think. It's about the transparency of the consequences and the steering effects of the status quo. Push the burden of proof on that, because then at all you can talk about a fair play of uh, ideas of how we want to move forward, and you can see how we regrow some of the important values and some of the basis for our stability, our freedom, our security, and our participation in the society and economy. Thank you very much, Maya. Michael? Here in Parliament, we have speaking time only for one minute. Uh, so I agree almost entirely with what Maya has just said. Um, it is the responsibility of economists and people who work in policy to, to debunk uh, all the orthodoxies, and I've spent most of my life trying to do that. Uh, it may surprise some of you. Um, uh, on the, I don't think this story is, I don't think the pers persuasion of the public is that difficult. The evidence is now there that the model we have, the model we've been running for 30 years, um, doesn't work. It produces terrible, terrible outcomes. Environmental outcomes, but also social outcomes. Huge inequalities, young people left with almost no hope of doing the basic things that their parents took for granted, getting a home, getting a decent job, getting a pension, and so on. The evidence seems to me to be very clear. What we haven't yet got are poli most politicians who are able to marshal that evidence with the experience that people can see around them. So it's not just kind of academic evidence, it's the evidence of their own lives with a story about how if we ditch that model, we can still live decent lives and not have less. Because that's the fear that's being put, that if we get rid of this model, we'll be even worse off despite the evidence of how badly off we are now. That seems to me to be about imaginative storytelling by politicians, uh, of whom we have a few here, and we need more. 
I think the public is absolutely ready for that. And, uh, but what we then need them to do with that is to elect governments that will implement policies that will constrain this capital, capitalist behemoth in enough to get us onto a sustainable, just path. But that will only be done by governments doing that, and that's why we need elected politicians to do this. And that's an old story, but that is the story of democracy. And we are very, very lucky to be still living in a democracy, and therefore we can have that hope of change. Perfect. Thank you, Michael. We come to the conclusion, and the first conclusions will be made by Elena. Yes. So I'm still a bit wondering what my life will be in your different futures. Also, not only as a human being, but as a living being on this planet Earth. Um, but I, I can uh, uh, pester you after this when we're eating lunch and try to figure out what my life will be. I also want to point back to the story from 2008 uh, when I was breastfeeding my little daughter and thought that land was the only thing that would be worth anything in the future. There has been times when owning land wasn't the way of making a living. You could make a living from the land without owning it. So it could be otherwise. Uh, and with that, I leave the word to you uh, to end, up, end this piece. Yes. Um it is 13.12, so we are um, over time. Um, this happens sometimes in Parliament. Uh, first of the things I want to say is um, I have the feeling that I learned a lot today. Um, I hope you learned a lot as well. Um, and the thing I learned is that we have to deal with all of the three theories in order to... Um, yeah, come away and, and, and implement something that could function and that th something that could make the life of my kids um, a good life. And this is somehow the conclusion I want to make. Um, there is no one single way to do. There are many ways, but there is one conclusion as well, and that is the way that we're actually doing with the GDP growth. Um, that we have to quit this way. This is, uh, for me, essential. We have to think about how we do it, how we could have people on our side to do it. We have to decide at the end. That's true. Michael says it several times. Politicians have to decide, but we, have, we need people from all over the political yeah, visions in order to help us to do that. And the, most, the Green Deal would never have happened if young people were not in the street on Friday. So this is somehow the conclusion I want to, to make. And uh, first of all, I want to thank the experts here in the panel, um, Maya online, um, Ekaterina here, Elena and Michael. Thank you very much for your input, for your argumentation, for your spirit to battle. Um, and uh, for being here and discuss with us. I think that this kind of discussion is really helpful, and I think um, my, my colleague, um, uh, Mr. Lamberts, um, for having organized this. I'm pleased to be here and to host this, and I hope um, you uh, have uh, had a uh, really a good time with us for here and with Maya online, and I would like to thank you as well for your question and um, for being here with us and thank you for that and have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.